just to do a quick intro, uh, and again, this is very informal, um, but I thought it was a great idea to have Tom Main, one of the most extraordinary architects and generous architects and generous human being and one of our founders, um, to have a talk. Um, but also the idea is to give a different sense to this talk, to get to do things that we would not do in, in a regular context. Um, about our, our own obsessions, our, our own desires. So what I asked Tom, which of course he's gonna do in his own term, was to focus or to show one project from beginning to an end and to go a little bit in depth. I'm pretty sure he's gonna bleed into other ideas like he always does. Uh, and again, um, he's one of the true heroes in architecture. So without further ado, again, this is a new formal kitchen conversation. Uh, Tom Main, I, I, I give you I give you not the floor but the screen to you. Okay, uh, for my um, my group, this is going to be somewhat redundant because I've taken this through this a couple times. This is about a particular building that's been a um, a genesis for for our work for um, for seven eight years. And um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm saying admit. Wow, I'm gonna I'm going to take you through the, the, um, the conceptual structure of this piece of work, and then I'm going to connect it to a series of um, ideas that are that are connected to all of the work in progress right now. It's funny because of the um, time framework of this, I was going to begin by showing kind of the, the huge variety of work in the office right now. I was going to kind of focus on the specificity of each project, and it seemed to be too general. But again, I'm going to tell you that. Um, Everything I'm going to talk about in terms of this piece of work is going to be um, connected to our assessment of the nature of the project within um, conceptual terms and in, in pragmatic terms. And it's going to start with um, the notion that the, um, the beginning of any project is in alignment with the, uh, the, conceptu the conceptual desires of the project and the obligations and the, uh, the requirements of the project within more pragmatic terms. And from the beginning, um, we were aware that uh, with this particular piece of work, it's a, uh, it's a campus um, in, in, in um, Pudong um, for a research group. And um, it was very open for potential. And we understood that it had, it had very high degree of, uh, of conceptual kind of possibilities. And then because of that, it's, again, it's a project. Hmm. I'm thinking very much of SciArc um, as an institution and the kind of the focus on highly conceptual information. And if the school, um, if there's a critique of the institution, it's going to have something to do with its alignment between purely conceptual, visual, aesthetic, subjective information, um, thinking, um, conceptualization, and its um, usefulness or its translation into various forms of reality. And again, I'm going to be very open in, in terms of the, the goals of the school and that that reality doesn't have to be necessarily architecture. It can have to do with industrial design, it can have to do with film, it can have to do with graphic design, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm very open to that. And so I'm starting with something that I thought would be useful to um, most people, um, a large group of people, both undergraduate and undergraduate. And it starts with a, um, a translation of a three-dimensional um, um, painting and um, it's looking for um, organizational ideas and qualities that are hard to kind of describe in words, but they're things that I'm operating on through hunches and they're interested in high levels of differentiation, complexity, multiple systems, things that have, I've been working with for, for quite a few years that are directly connected to um, the development of a building organizationally and spatially. And, um, and then again, I've, I've, I'm using this project because it's one of the projects that I've had time to spend to, to um, document in ways that are um, didactic. And so that I can show um, a series of these, um, there's, there's 27 and counting kind of drawings that I've been working with over the last five years. And, and it's translation into something that represents a beginning um, conceptualization visually 
that's going to develop into a more conventional notion of a plan that's going to lead to an organization of a large building or a complex of buildings, in this case, of a campus. This is about a half a kilometer long, the thing that it's going to develop into. And um, I'm going to take that now, and I'm going to start translating the, the, um, the multiple systems that make up the framework of this set of ideas, that make up the framework of the drawings and the sculpture, the three-dimensional drawings, and uh, that have to do with the various systems. And they're now being, um, to some degree, rationalized as they perform very specific functions having to do with the nature of this building, which has to do with um, a large range of functions. It's irrelevant what they are. It, whether it's a library, a meeting space, an office space, um, a recreational space, those are just all specifics that, that um, I've given very differentiated spatial possibilities to. And again, the idea being is that um, what we do is we continually formalize, spatialize, uh, concretize um, activity and um, at multiple levels um, having to do with its um, uh, an, an emotional content or a, um, a, a content of ritual, something much more broad than just the notion of pure functionality in a, in a scientific sense. And so you're looking at the building of up the structure as I look at the multiple systems as they allow me to um, deal with the various performances and the functionalities of this building or this complex, in this case, of this campus <clears throat> that um, produce um, the ultimate system. And I'm, again, I'm looking for something that has the uh, complexity of a found city or village that's taken place over centuries. And of course, it's based on um, a whole series of interests which happen to do with um, chance behavior, because I've been interested in organizing randomness, strategies that embrace uncertainty, the non sequitur, the ephemeral, and um, all of it having to do with the unfinished and the incomplete, um, the spontaneous um, um, accident. All of these things are, are things that I've been pursuing again in, these, in, in this strategy. And again, um, what hopefully is clear here is I'm interested in a, um, a methodology that organizes and has an a, a organizational strategy um, that removes some pure subjectivity. That, that's useful to you as architects, if I could pass this on, that it's not totally private. And that would be in itself a, a kind of a, a separate conversation. And then that turns into, um, again, in, in terms of a conventional plan here, and we're looking at it in terms of the way architects understand things within plan. As they look at the kind of highly kind of functional characteristics of the various spaces. And then um, one of the, um, the interest in this piece of work that was its foundation was its relationship to landscape. And um, the, this is an idea that this is a, a, a set of ideas that I've been working with now for, for quite a few decades. And it, it, it started, I'm going to talk about it at the very end, in early projects in the uh, late 80s, and um, where the ground is no longer passive but active and it's constructed and it's generative and, and sometimes very much dominant. And it's forming a, um, a very new admixture of nature and um, a synthetic hybrid between typology and morphology. And I'm looking for this, this project is talking about kind of looking for a new kind of model having to do with something that is in this hybrid state or this in between to be straight between groundscape and building. And because of that, the section becomes kind of the primary kind of understanding of the building. And then with that, as you cut the sections, um, has to do with the kind of radical differentiation that every section is literally different. There's no um, self-similarity through this. And it's sort of complete assault on the, um, the kind of simplicity of uh, repetition. And then um, as we continue this project, it now starts um, organizing in different terms. And we're looking at now the elements as they, they form relationships. And as we can discuss them as isolated elements, and it's gonna to have to very much to do as we start moving into um, the realization in structural terms and physical terms, et cetera. And then um, again, as, as, you, as you all know today, um, 
our methods of working digitally have to do with just various outputs. So various forms of drawings, um, whether they be analytical or perceptual models, et cetera, are all different outputs of the same, um, of, of the same kind of continuous flow of information as it's done digitally. So again, it'd be something, um, it's gonna be, I'm gonna trigger off another kind of subject here that might lead to some questions. If, if I was gonna work on the educational model at all and kind of shift it a bit, I would move to depth. And then I think my own critique of uh, education is you reach the same place over and over at a conceptual level. And I think um, the profession now is, um, architecture has the possibility of dealing with um, huge amount of information simultaneously. And that um, each of them starts altering the direction of the work and redefining the, the conceptual nature of the work. And so again, as we move into this project very early, not at a later stage, in a very early conceptual stage in schematics, we're already looking at the buildability and we're looking at the structure and we're modeling that. And the engineers are not doing that. We're doing that and we're controlling it. And of course we can look at it in, in drawing form and in, in various forms of an, analytical forms. And we can see it within model forms. And this is what we're giving the engineer to work with, that we're taking control of this. and. Um, and looking at kind of the nature of that. And again, um, the relationship of model and built reality. And we're looking at something that um, is now the realization of the differentiation and the goals of the project having to do with the level of complexity that now is inherent in the building process. And we have to take responsibility of that. We, don't, we, um, we have to resolve our own problems and our own ambitions. And again, um, I'm showing you images that show the um, Hmm. the scale, the, uh, the, the, the degree of the problem in terms of its complexity. And then again, um, it takes every aspect of the piece of work um, having to do with the construction. So we're now looking at the, the, the system of the, the surfaces and the skin. And again, we're able to document that in an incredibly precise way where we're literally defining every fragment of the skin. And um, this is also gonna have to do with, I think uh, maybe various, people out there are, are using this in your studio. Today, um, when you're making models, you're constructing, um, you're, con you're, you're building and constructing work. They're no longer abstract drawings. They're actually virtual um, pieces of work that are in construction. And you're taking responsibility of that for again, kind of one of the, the key elements in the system that we're able to, um, in a very precise way, um, uh, understand the, um, the constructional processes that um, are in a line with our conceptual objectives and having to do with um, the relationship of multiple systems, which in itself produces huge complexity. And we're taking responsibility, if you look at the, um, the, 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 the constructed image on the, uh, on the left, we were responsible for literally every one of those pieces that were, were part of that kind of process. And again, it's in early, early phases, we're already understanding that and looking at it. <clears throat> and all of these things um, are multivalent. This is structural, it's the mechanical system, as well as a conceptual organizational system. So all of them provide kind of multiple functions. And then um, the result. And again, something which is um, discussing um, Hmm. A system that's made up of chance behavior. There's no a priori design. It's a it's a reflection of the um, of an operational strategy. And again, my class this will be kind of straightforward because they're already at a place where all of you that are there today that are already at this place that so you have clear kind of broad ideas um, that come from an organizational um, approach. And again, something that's hybrid where landscape and building are now singular and landscape is building or it is functional or it's used as well as things that look like conventional structure. And of course with landscape is dynamic and you get the huge kind of opportunities of um, plant material, et cetera. And, and we're interested in bringing the farm into the city and making a connection between the urban and the, the rural, which is a part of the conversation, which I'm gonna to come to in a few minutes in, in later projects. And then again, um, continually differentiating um, conditions that come out of this language. 
So as you move through the building, there's this constant relationship between um, constructed nature and constructed building. Um, and there's this continual relationship between new conditions and um, at times um, kind of unique or idiosyncratic conditions that um, come out of the, the, the system we're using that is all based on um, operational strategies, which reinforce um, relationships versus objects. And that all um, are again, um, part of a, a combinatory kind of strategy, which are challenging any um, totalizing singularities. And um, it's scalar, it operates at multiple scales and the same idea keeps working through the building at, at, at every kind of um, level of, um, of scale, which it finally finds some sort of a, a human scale that has to do with a certain level of intimacy, let's say. And again, um, because of the relationship of chance and the, the relationship of relationships, uh, there's a focus on of, of spaces in between and connect the tissue and accident. And then again, a continual looking at the building that has to do with the kind of radical differentiation of spatial types. Uh, whoop, whoop. Uh, it's not behaving. Uh, where the, um, this system of combinatory elements continually um, changes the possibility having to do with his relationship to other elements. And my own critique, our critique would have to do with the, um, the degree of variation, the degree of differentiation that takes place within the system that'll have to do with future projects and the trajectory of this project as it, as it produces other work. And the interior systems are gonna, are gonna be parallel to the interior and exterior are seen as singular and all of them are gonna connect to site and constructed building. Okay, um, I've included five separate subtopics that that come from this piece of work. And one is um, in, uh, a discussion that it's located um, through a, a series of projects which took place over three decades. And it actually started with a student project. And I thought this would be, I just added this, that would be interesting to you as a reminder of the, um, the potential power of your education. And this is a piece of work I worked on with, with Ralph Knowles in the second year that had to do with um, uh, a building that was generated off of multiple forces, which started me on my um, kind of set of interests that I'm still working with. And then of course, um, in the late 80s, we're working on a residence in, Cro in the Crawford residence in Santa Barbara. And it was the beginning of, of an interest in, in site and building and the measurement of site, which very much came out of interest with people like Heiser, et cetera. And then that led quickly to a, a piece of work for the, the, the Diamond Bar School, which is continuing with that and the competition we did with Wolf Pricks actually for the um, a, a, um, a theater center. Um, you can see his piece, of course, cutting across and that, that, that kind of terrorizes ours. And then a competition that um, actually Wolf invited us to in, in, in Vienna, which was the first time we started looking at land and the construction of landscape as a major idea. And it became a very active ingredient in the work and it became a kind of fixation at this point. And then again, the, the, the Chiba project where we're working with the, the measurement of land and we're, we're, we're we're diminishing the notion of any kind of um, singularity of architecture, and we're dealing with architecture as a um, as an augmentation of landscape. And then the second one is the formal, and that from um, mm, decades now, I've been interested in um, 
organizations or idea or constructs that come out of subjectivity and that are connected to a, a, a certain idea of a complexity and differentiation, which I can't quite describe, but from the sketch to the current drawings, I'm organizing and, and um, hmm, the best I can describe it is I'm, um, I have an interest in instinctual qualities that'd be characteristic of somebody like um, Frank Gehry or Wolf Pricks or maybe Marika and Rias. But I have organizational kind of instincts that are much closer to, to Peter Eisman and to Bernard Chumi. And I'm um, meaning that I'm trying to organize the, 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 the subjective or the, the things that I can't describe that come out of the sketch. That are that are taking place instinctually and and, and um, sub subjectively and in some way unconsciously, and I'm now trying to organize those into um, a series of works. And these again are drawings that become a suite of work that I've been working on for a while, and and they have characteristics that are clearly from an architect. They're scalar, and they have to do with um, I can move in them, and they have a huge amount of information, and then they come from the three dimensional work. And again, this would be a much longer, I guess, conversation, but very simply, these are the, the generations which I showed you at the beginning, this building, and they're, um, they're interested in exploring complex um, interactions between multiple systems that lead to complex spatial and organizational ideas. And again, they're scalar. I can kind of operate at multiple levels, and I'm looking for... Um, hmm, organizational ideals which are going to challenge and, and, and uh, the work we're doing in more conventional terms. And then um, something's happening very recently, and, and maybe quite a few of you are working at this direction. Um, we're now scripting, and we're um, using a quasi-AI that can now, um, to some degree, program this language and now generate um, more or less infinite numbers of capabilities. And um, this is two of the schemes you've looked at. Um, Dan's, I think, on this thing, and you should ask Dan some of this because he's the one that's that's working on the, the actual program that's doing this. And what I'm fascinated with this is that um, we're looking at um, numbers of possibilities that have to do with the, um, what is it? The, um, we, we work, uh, we produce something and we evaluate it and we make a decision uh, based on that evaluation to somehow change it, alter it, um, proceed with it in some way. And it's a, um, it's, it's a series of judgments we're making very personally. And when I'm looking at this is I'm, I'm, I'm now able through this process, I'm gonna go back. Whoop. I'm able to look at now, um, this is a hundred, but more or less infinite numbers of possibilities um, that are taking place instantaneously. And it's a, definitely something that's extremely kind of fascinating to me. And it's um, it's both already moving in the direction of the, um, um, ooh, Fuge, the battery's low already. Give me an extension, could you my plug in my extension cord? Thank you. The, um, it's, it's already challenging the kind of uh, the notion of the, the singular hand and the, the notion of the author, um, which is again, a conversation we could have had with this work, but um, it's something that definitely is gonna be kind of part of the, the, our future. And then this direction is directly leading to um, kind of architectural work where um, whoop, I can go back and again, look at a huge number of alternatives with this system. And this is a pavilion, that's a series of pavilions for a, for a project. And, um, in um, Nanjing. And um, again, I'm, I'm able to look at multiple alternatives using a single system that has to do with uh, the ideas I'm talking about. And then finally, uh, I'm ending with the, 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 the clearest trajectory of the work I started with at the Giant Project has to do with the urban. And the notion of combinatory, the notion of chance strategy, the relationship of ground, augmented ground, the notion of how we start projects in terms of the relationship between assessing 
organizational ideas and the relationship of the complexity of those ideas that are suitable for complex problems are all um, connected to work at the scale. And on, how's that? Great. Um, so uh, what we're going to do now is um, let's first invite uh, let's invite people who are watching in YouTube. There were like 25 people watching, 25, 30 people watching YouTube. So they're welcome to join us for this part of the Q&A. Um, I ask it. Um, um, if it's okay, Tom, I'm going to stop your sharing so we can see everybody. Okay. Um, um, just give me one second. Here we go. So I ask everybody to use the chat for questions, but if somebody wants to ask a question directly, that's okay too. But before we, before we open the floor, uh, I, I would like, I would like to couple of things. One, it's always great to hear you talk. And I, I had the pleasure to see many of your talks over the years. Uh, the first one many, many years ago in 93 in Argentina. So it has, it has been um, almost 30 years of watching you talk. Uh, so it's interesting. <laughs> oh, to, no, no, but I, I say that it's a, it's a, in a, and of course, as a student with your books, so on, it has been a, lo a long, a long time. I've been, I've been paying attention to your work. And you mentioned about something today for the first time since I know you about yeah. the, the traditional form of Wolf, Frank, and two, and also been interesting uh, on the critical strategic of Bernardo Peter. But there is a recurring series of obsessions and grammar that they keep appearing again and again in the projects, in the drawings, in the 3D models. So I, 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 want, I want you to elaborate a little bit longer about okay. those two relationships. Yeah, the um, uh, the computer um, again. I'm looking at John Enright in front of me. Um, it showed up in in the um, early '90s, the mid '90s, and it was kind of seamless in the sense that it allowed us for um, to deal with complex operations having to do with the connection of things, basically. And it was what we've been doing for for a decade already. So it was an absolute kind of natural tool. And it was nothing kind of extraordinary. It was just as if it was you know, it was it was there for us to use, in terms of um, producing connections and relationships versus things, and or com complex things, whatever. But uh, I have to say that um, um, I I'm aware that I'm very much a cusp character, and that I deal with it in very kind of mechanical, simple terms. The things you're looking at, for instance, the the, the drawings. And the the objects are, are based on differencing, and they're very um, I think kind of primitive in some way. Um, but I'm able to use simple tools to develop very complex, somewhat complex kind of organizational ideas. Um, I would I would listen to my the the, the students here, the young people here, because I would have said that um, I'm aware that that I'm generationally challenged, and that I'm producing a set of things that. Um, hmm, the ideas are definitely somehow hybridized between my early training and my um, my basically my interests that are much more physical and um, hmm, uh, they're, they're mechanical in, in some sense and um, in, in a world that potentially moves beyond that. But again, I'd be listen, listening to other people because it seems like I have um, it's. <clears throat> I'm comfortable that it's taken me to where I want to go at this moment, but I see it as somewhat limited. And that I, um, in fact, again, I'm looking at Larissa right in front of me. Um, my sense is, and I, and I can only see Dan, but I, he's here still, that as you make these connections, that they're going to be much more complicated. That as it'd be like in, in evolutionary biology, as two cellular matters come together, um, there's going to be some new invention taking place that's not just something that is add add subtract or the, the, the kind of simplicity we're doing but it's gonna be something much more complicated and i can kind of conceive that in my head but i don't have the ability to do that and it's for me it's the next generation but i would think what's maybe more important would be um its relationship to a broader interest of how you're using these tools in terms of your own values that you're supporting architecturally. That I would think it starts from um, hmm, 
the goals you have or the, 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 the ability to define the tools you need to, um, to succeed in, 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 your, in your project. Because again, it, um, again, I'm looking at, at, at Sanar and Alyssa right in front of me, Zizi. Um, the, the project in this case is an urban project which has cultural, social, political, infrastructural, urban I, constructs, right? Goals. And we're looking for um, an organizational structure that is ability to accomplish the complexity and the, the um, multiplicity of the forces that are taking place that challenge the um, somewhat simple kind of ideas that exist today in an urban, in an urban setting. So it would, it would have to be a connection between the operational strategy and the, um, the, 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 the broader ambitions that, that one has as, as an architect or urban designer. Is that at all, is that helping or not? Yeah, I think, I think, it's, I think that's pretty clear. Um, uh, for anybody else, if anybody has questions, you can use a chat or you can just um, unmute yourself and ask directly. Um, if not, I'm happy to keep talking with Tom, but I think it's an opportunity for everybody to use this platform. I have a to question. Ch to teach chat. John, go ahead. Hey, Tom. Great, well, first of all, uh, you know, I've never seen all the images of the giant project and I'd seen like kind of maybe the three best ones, but there, there are parts of it that I hadn't seen at all. Really, really amazing project actually. Um, and it seems like that holds a lot of uh, moments for you that I see the connection between your drawings and a building, right? Like there's that one image of underneath in a kind of elliptical space that's a road, right? So it's actually a, an intersection of a kind of urban space with a figure, which is a building, which is circulation. Right. right. Because of our history, I think I know you well enough that I know the pieces of the buildings that you really love or like hit it for you. Like after all the work and all the energy that you're doing, there are these moments, they're almost episodic and we see them in the drawings and we see them in the buildings. And, and I wrote some things down that you said, I just wanted to like contextualize it. This is a super interesting presentation because you start off with a kind of abstraction and you talk about uh, a methodology that organizes. And, and the second thing you says removes pure subjectivity. So, uh -huh. so you're working on a problem, right? Uh -huh. And it's systems and it's stuff and it has an eye towards complexity and, and intersection, right? Which is an analogy to, I think, your attitudes about the city, which is the cities at their best are layered with collision, complexity, multiple systems colliding, which is human okay. interchange. I remember you used to describe Diamond Ranch High School that we worked on years ago and you showed an image of it. The whole thing was a social experiment about trying to get the uh, kids in a high school to, to cross pollinate with ideas. It was just a machine to do that. Maybe you still think that, but um, it's so interesting because then at the end you show the drawings and you start, you, you say the word again, but not in a pejorative of removes pure subjectivity. You say, and then there's the formal and it's subjective. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and, there, and, and then you say it's about complexity and differentiation, which is of course, just like you, when you're talking about the building and you talk about radical differentiation, and I love this term, the assault on simplicity of repetition. Like that's an awesome statement. Like that's literally an attack <laughs> at something. Okay, so, but this comes up and I want, and the reason I'm asking the question is, is and it comes up with your students and on critiques and, and you, 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 you a little bit um, uh, tinge on it when you talk about an educational model as a critique and maybe of SciArc, uh, of which you're both like complicit and part of, and then outside of, I think, as like a practitioner looking in, right. but then you, you, you love it too, because you're a formalist, self-admitted, you like to draw and you're totally happy in the world of abstraction, yet then you're out there like doing these amazing projects all over the world. So, so there's always that conflict, right, between the two. And I think everyone always wants to know what comes first, like 
do you start with that drawing and then you just lay it down and then you make a building work? I don't think it's that. No. But then no. again, it isn't, doesn't come from the brief. They didn't say make a building that looks like a snake that cantilevers over the water. That's what we want. You invented that. Yep. So how do you reconcile that? And I think it comes through with your students too, because you demand a lot out of them. You, you demand I, like both the formal and the functional. Right. So how do you, but, uh, maybe just give us your crib notes of how you deal with it in the office, your own, your own struggle with it, and how you articulate it to people who have to work on projects to certainly your students. It's funny when uh, recently, the, the, when uh, the discussion with Michael Sorkin, uh, there was a, an issue that came up that he was somebody that was interested in the, um, the, the, the aesthetics and the ethical. And I wouldn't maybe say ethical, but I would say that architecture by definition is this definition between the subjective, the aesthetic, um, and um, the, the oblig obligatory social, political, environmental, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be the nature of architecture. And so it's not even, a, for me, it's just so, so basic. Um, the, the beginning is a hunch, no question. It's, it's a guess that we work artistically. We don't work like scientists. We, we make guesses, we make hunches, we work with radically Im, imperfect information and um, we, we, we intuit. But then right after that, um, as if maybe in certain writing, poetry, even film, you could even leave it at that. But as architects, we sign, finally, um, it is a social art form and it's connected both socially and culturally and it's connected environmentally and scientifically it has weight, it withstands gravity and on and on, that, that it's rationalized. But going back to your, the other, the notion of language, and it comes up in my, in the, in my connection, the academy, um, and it seems to be somewhat mm, um, ubiquitous at the moment, is that if the work becomes too subjective, where it's people's opinion, I have absolutely no understanding of even how to operate in that environment. And when I'm listening to juries and the juries, when somebody says they like something, it just makes my hair stand up. Number one, why would anybody care? And um, these are broad cultural conversations that are you looking at a poll then if, 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 if the majority of the, of the jury likes it, that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think we have to place it within some discursive terms. And it's not that that can't happen because I'm gonna be an absolute supporter of certain people that operate purely within an intuitive subjective realm, but it can't be a, um, a, a broad, um, it can't be institutionalized, I don't think, as a school. And that's where I'm gonna be, I'm gonna stop and say, no, uh, there has to be some discourse in terms of what the framework is at least of, of, the, of the, 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 the conceptual kind of ideas that are in front of us. Otherwise, you're not, there's no need for an institution. There's no need for discourse. And again, um, as you know, John, because that's how we worked, um, I work off of discourse and I work out of, out of conversation and it's never me, it's always us, right? Uh, for the people listening there, John and I were just having a conversation recently about uh, the school and about Hoopa Bank. And if you ask John, he's gonna tell you it's his project. And I'm gonna agree with you. John, you you there? Yeah, I'm here. It's ours, right? And and there's yeah. no inter there's no interest in separating well, which parts of project or which person is irrelevant. But it, the point being, um, the discourse has to do with an agreement at a very complex level. To me, the only relationship would be similar would be psychoanalytic. It'd be analysis. It'd be on a couch. Would be the only relationship to become close to the kind of intimacy it takes with people working together at a deep level that actually can operate within these more complex subjective terms, which are which again leads us right into kind of psychological kind of uh, kind of ideas, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that, and and thank you for the compliment. Uh, I don't know if I would say it's mine, but I do. I will say this: that you have created an environment, a, a way of working and a group of people, and this includes, I think, how you teach, but definitely in your office, I've always been amazed at just like your open, just like the kinds of relationships you like in drawings or formal things, multiplicity, collision, systems, layers, interchange, if I use yeah. those words, 
uh, I think you actually also like that in the structure of the office in the sense of you're open to input within a set boundary. I mean, your work is, is you know, it's not all over the place. It's got, it's, it's, it's got a history. You self-reference your work, which I think all architects do and all the best ones do. Uh, but within that, you allow participation of multiple individuals. And I think you thrive in that. And therefore the individuals feel like they have input and maybe ownership, which is an amazing dynamic. This is not maybe about uh, the formal aspects of architecture, but it's a way of working, which I think you have, which doesn't get talked about a lot. It's like, everybody just looks at the work and you're wow. a genius and there's a bunch of people working on it. And that's great. Wow. You know? Not that's not your words, but that's how the outside world looks at things. But the the machine, if there is a machine, or the workings of how you set up your office, how you built your office, how the relationships work, the people you hire, what they feel about you and the work is is equally complex as your drawings in the sense that they're like layers of systems and individuals and people that all have a voice. And when they all collide and kind of make things, it seems like where the magic happens. Anyway. But the, 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 John, kind of John, that goes back to your, your first question that um, if you're working beyond um, a singularity, if you're if, if you have if you're working with a group of people, it would go back to the connection between the subjective and the organizational or the, the methodological. And again, for me, and it was why I early on was very fascinated with with Eisman's numbered houses and with with Bernard and his work um, with the connected the, the connected systems Lavalette particularly um, that, that that there was a there was a discursive there was a there was a clarity to the work in terms of its ambition in aesthetically and um, mm, I think it, for me it, it could be pushed a bit more towards the more random or the more subjective that is a little too um, authoritarian those those two characters and um, and my, my own goal has been able to push that kind of limit in, 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 into things that are a little more complicated in, in, in subjective terms. But again, the, the, the notion of working collectively, it would be again like the, the academic, like in, in a studio, there has to be some, what, threshold, some minimal ground of, of discursive connective tissue being able to describe the system that you're working with or the, um, the broader ambition within the the aesthetic system that you're talking about i mean isn't that would yeah. that be somehow the debt the 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 threshold of a studio and that right. you can see that in a studio with the is the instructor that you see in fact that there is um a commonality and that commonality represents that connective tissue mm -hmm. tom yeah. we have a question let me put it bigger so you can read it and you can answer it uh I know. Zizi, to everyone. Hi, Tom. What do you think of the next level of the competitor urbanism will take or should include? What dimensions would you think the current model lacks? Um, you know, um, I'm going to answer that kind of obliquely. Um, I've, I've never been able to anticipate um, where I'm going. And I'm not somebody that thinks about the future or a trajectory. I just wake up in the morning and go to work. And it seems as though that um, I'm asking questions continually day to day. And so that, um, and I don't believe in an anticipatory planning. I don't, I don't believe in it anyway. I don't believe in future. <clears throat> um, I have a hard enough time dealing with the present. And um, the answer is, I don't know. But I anticipate that um, that that the, um, the increased complexity or an ability to have organization systems that help us deal with the, 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 the enormous amount of information that we deal with in a, in a single piece of architecture, much less as the scale has increased and as the project become more urban and more infrastructural that um, I'm interested in pursuing whatever ideas we're working with that have the capability of helping us deal with those kinds of problems. 
right, as they continually deal with it and, and, and in shorter periods of time, which is the pragmatic part as an architect. So that the project you guys are doing right now, um, or the, the last project I showed you, the competition um, the, the, for, for um, um, the, the Chengdu, um, that's, done, that's a competition done in six weeks, which is absurd, right? And um, I'm now working on a large city plan and uh, in a year <laughs> for a city of a million, it's absolutely, totally absurd. And, and, and I'm interested in developing the tools that can help us solve the kind of problems that they're asking us to solve in, in, in the real world, right? And, um, and that's all I can do, right? And then after that, it's, whatever we talk about in the class would be the answer to your question. They were constantly kind of asking questions of, of, of where we are at this moment and how this particular method is, um, is useful to us or, or, or our own critique of the method. And at that point, it, it, it's gonna discuss the, um, the necessity for being extremely tough on your own work, right? That you, through that critique will come the reiterative, the reiteration of that work. And again, John was talking about the studio. That would be one of the absolute, um, that would be part of a connected tissue of the studio, that people understand that your critique is a method of, of moving the project forward, right? Uh, we have another one from Shayo, Tom. Hi, Tom, can you describe your own interpretation of the nature and notion of the coherency of nature? <laughs> <laughs> the coherency of nature. Um, 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 oh. <laughs> it's easy. I haven't got a clue. It's. Um, I think it's more and more going to follow a biological, uh, ecological uh, trajectory, and uh, and it's it's going to be about the understanding of things in in connection to other things and not as isolated. And it's going to go from biology to zoology to ecology that we only understand um, living things in the relationship to their environment. And it's going to start with some very basic kind of premises, and then um, and again, I would think um, I'm looking at all the student faces out there. Um, I would think as young people, you, you would be looking at kind of establishing the terms of you as an architect at this moment of time. And it seems as though, like the early moderns in the teens and the twenties of the twentieth century, that we're now looking at a radically different world that had started already at the end of the nineteenth century. With 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 the with the Darwins and the Einsteins and etc. etc. Et right, and they were looking at the world that moved from static to dynamic, and that looked at a world in, within much more complex terms. I would say there's some of that stuff taking place at the moment, at the next level, right? And that we understand the world in highly relative terms, and that it'd be starting your own interest in terms of what you see the, the goals of architecture are of your generation. Uh we, we have another one, uh, Tom. Does everybody see this Allen. or do I have to read it? No, no, I think everybody can see it. I'm sharing my screen oh, okay. with everybody. After That's carefully why crafting so everybody can read it. drawings you produce yourself, what does the AI contribute to the produce better work of your own work to produce? How many iterations you... Ah, what's taking place is, um, is the discretionary aspect. And if Dan's still there, um, I didn't do those. Dan did them. Right, um, and now I'm looking at a hundred reiterations of a particular scheme, and we have uh, 27 different models, and we're now looking at a hundred different iterations of each one. And what was fascinating is I looked at the hundred, I found 50 plus or minus that I thought were stronger than quote my or our scheme, and all it's doing is giving me a broader. Um, set of possibilities it's not solving anything you're still making a constant decision and in fact uh, we now look at that and realize that we have to make it much more specific that we need more information to take that the next step but it's um it's just the ability to look at many more options within a very rapid time framework philip i see you there how you been <laughs> okay i'm a good time how are you <laughs> this is I really another one tom this is, okay. I have another one, Tom. Uh, this is from Ming Ming Fang. I I, Ming. I see Craig Hodges too there, so I, I don't know if it's only Ming or both. To your architecture, <laughs> worldview. Um, in um, 
in uh, what a dozen worlds or less. Um, Ming, my worldview. <laughs> just, um, <laughs> God, I don't know. You're asking if the sky is why is the sky blue? Um, uh, my worldview. I guess I'm going to go to um, that. I understand architecture is a social art form. I'm interested in uh, agency and engagement, and I'm just born that way, I think. But maybe some of it has come was how I was, uh, how I grew up in the neighborhoods that I was in, et cetera, et cetera. That's personal. Um, but I cannot see architecture as an unengaged activity, although I hugely support the, Leb the Lebius Woods, and you, you know, all those people, but that's not who I am. Um, and I'm still hung up in early modernist ideas that architecture can shape society and can shape the individual, but with um, a little more realistic kind of sensibility to that statement, right? And a little more modest in, in my goal but um, I'm convinced that we actually have a role in society that goes beyond the aesthetic. And of course, as you get older, you're very even self-critical of your own personal private interests, which include, by the way, everything aesthetic. And you realize you have a very small audience and that your program um, diversifies in terms of what your interests are, in terms of what architecture can accomplish, and that you recognize that the aesthetic or the, 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 the again, this, this kind of territory that might be at my heart that what I'm most interested in and I feel I'm most capable of doing isn't in fact the main topic. And it would go back to the early discussion of beginnings and making assessments of the possibilities of each project are quite different. And again, I chose the giant because it had huge potential conceptually. I, I couldn't build that project in, the, in this country ever, never. I'm just starting a project literally an hour before this for a university. And if I showed them that, they'd fire me. I mean, it'd be totally impossible. And, um, but again, it'd be, it, it, I think in the very beginning, and it's again, something I, mean, I think could happen a little more in education that, um, that there is an some sort of an agreement of the obligatory because again i get young people in my office that if they get stuck with something that has to do with obligation they see it as kind of a negative and i'm going hey guys it's just we're actually getting paid for this and and uh it's, it's actually it's, it's a right we, we're getting a fee and we, we have we have, do have obligations to do stuff and um and i think our own private world has to be seen in much more personal um it's a um it's a kind of an honor in a way to be able to do something very private and personal that you understand five people in the world might understand that that's a real privilege to do that it can't be taken for granted right that if you're, if you're expecting to to, to to muck around in the world and people are um investing huge resources in you in terms of the narrow right and um Again, maybe that comes with age. Also, that's something that you can't you can't do as a young person. Yeah, that it comes with experience, All right? And um, but a bit of that, the, the, there is a connection between there. There has to be between the obligatory and the and, and the, the more private and the more personal, because it isn't finally a personal act; it's a social act. We uh, we have another one, Tom. Uh, Larissa. You mentioned the importance that you're engaging in social and political. What is the challenging part? Huh. The, um, I had one of the largest honors of my life took place two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I was on, um, I don't even know the guy's name, Tucker. What's his first name on Fox News? Anybody know? Yeah. Carlson Tucker in Fox News. Yeah. Anyway, the, right. the Trump Trump did the, the, the Federalist architecture thing, and they use my courthouse and the San Francisco building as the objects that are horrific. And he actually, um, on his show, called me out personally as Tom Maine, and then I was un-American. And this glass of wine, a very nice kind of Italian wine right now. Um, we, 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 we would have invited people over, but we couldn't. Uh, but we, we gave cheers here. Um, um, 
architecture is a uh, it's a con it, it's it's a it's a social act. It's connected, and um, um, you can make the connection between your own language and your own formalization of ideas. Um, to me, Cooper Uni would be that. I'm proud of that building. And it, it, you can look at it aesthetically, or you can look at it in terms of its performance and how it operates as a social pedagogy and how it's interested in connecting engineering and art and architecture as a, as a, as a social educational engagement. And you can look at it urbanistically, et cetera, and you can hate the building and I'm going, it's fine. You like it or don't like it, that's your business, or you like the interior and hate the exterior. And, um, but, but, but finally, <laughs> um, yeah, and, and um, it's um, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I've never met this man, and all of a sudden I'm un-American, which is possibly true in his eyes. Um, but um, I have to say that was, um, and again, I'm a formal, whatever, kind of architect, and I was that would be one of my proudest moments for sure that that I was able to kind of represent the opposite of that and make a little dent in the world. Right. And um, and for all the people that talk about freedom, of course, if somebody talks about freedom. You already know you got a problem that they have no fucking clue what it is. And of course, in this country, we have an incredibly um, in this country being the U.S. of A., we have an extremely kind of unsophisticated notion of freedom. That's um, in Eric Fromm's term, freedom um, from versus freedom to. And of course, everybody listening, everybody tuned in today is interested in the second one, and that we're interested in the nature of kind of expanding kind of opportunities, and not worried about the uh, the the, the, uh, the kind of maintaining of that through the, the from part. But um, uh, um, Larissa, you, we we just um, you decide in terms of the work what your own issues are, in terms of your own person, in terms of you can make a contribution or what or does architecture have a role in, in 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 anything that's that's important to you in those terms right and um and again i think you're going to find like most young architects when we were working on little cafes and little house remodels they're pretty simple projects and they operate formally and as the work gets more substantial and it has more connection that it allows you to to um hmm to exhibit characteristics that people might not know exist in you because they relate it, right? And now you have an opportunity that happened to us with San Francisco, and all of a sudden it's it's about it's about um, it's, uh, the the notion of, of energy and public space and and workforce, etc. And it was because we had an opportunity to deal with a project that had large kind of meaty issues, right? That they, they didn't take place within the, in the smaller work and the smaller work allowed us to kind of develop the language and kind of a direction of, 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 the, of the formation of this thing, right? And again, um, it was interesting with the, the Carlson Tucker, they hate the look of the building. Nobody mentioned once that we reversed the, um, the management and labor and we put a, a, a daycare center in the in the public lobby, and we made a, a courtyard that faced the the, 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 the seventh court of the court of appeals, and um, that it uses no air conditioning. It was the first tall building. They're so absurdly wrapped up in the look, right? That it's just totally crazy. But you're uh, Tom, Tom, maybe um, since we're coming close to the end, and, and probably it's an unfair and loaded question since we are in the midst of it. But um, in, in the couple, in the last two or three weeks, in conversation with the students and with colleagues and so on, um, there, there is, of course, um, a cloud in, uh, above us because with the crisis that we're facing and uh, a global crisis that, uh, at least for the majority of us, we've never seen in our lives. And maybe since the Second World War, then we don't have something yeah. like this. So everybody's interested to start to see um, what how architecture is going to have to evolve and mutate to deal with the world that will come after this. It's going to be a radically changed one, uh, or not? I mean, we, we have to wait and see how we how we operate as a species. But under the premise that any crisis and the, uh, on, on one of this magnitude is an opportunity also for change. Um, and again, I, I, I'm fully aware how loaded and unfair it is because we are in the middle of it and we have no clue. But like this is what we do, and we speculate um, on on premises like these ones and, and not as big ones this one, but in things like this. What, what are your first thoughts? I mean, how, how, while we're navigating this, 
what 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 you start to think i mean what what the world that is coming after this how architecture how, what how are we going to keep to evolving and adapting to this um, this is not just my question this is something that's been floating around in conversation everybody tried uh, to understand what it's going to be right i'm looking at craig and Meg on my screen here and, and i'm curious uh craig would answer this or Meg. um I mean, it, and maybe my this is where my optimism is going to get in the way. Um, uh, well, we need optimism this is, this right is, now. This so. is not the, this is not a completely unique historic kind of occurrence that's taking place, um, and we're going to come out of it. Um, we will come out of this, and there there will be a, a somewhat new normal. Um, it's interesting, um, starting with the conversation we're having today, and this is the very first time I've done this lecturing in Zoom. And talking to how many people I see in front of me, and I'm looking at faces, and um, it, it, it's it's quite interesting actually. And we're about it's to quite cool in many ways. Jury, well, we're I'm about to do a series of juries, and again, I'd have to talk to you now in two weeks from now. It'll be fascinating. But one of these are inviting people from all over the world. The, the location doesn't mean anything. And um, um, but I, 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 in terms of very specifically, we're discussing how it's going to change our office structure, and there's no question it's going to change it that um, some of this is not new at all, that um, if you're with, with Google or if you're with Rand Corporation, there's a, there's a much more kind of contemporary notion of the digital world and, and the physical world. And um, definitely that's gonna be part of it. Um, and one of the things that seems to be apparent is happening, that there is gonna be no end in a traditional sense. This is not gonna end in any clean kind of way. There's gonna be a very strange kind of transition. And so we're gonna we're gonna understand how to live in in a in a in an environment that's um gonna reoccur to some degree, and it's gonna change definitely a very specific social interaction, etc. That's gonna happen that we're gonna find out in another couple months. Um, um, here now we talked about it in terms of the school. It's possible the school open up and people have a ten foot square, and again there's gonna be somehow a working out of what's digital and what's physical, and. Um, and in fact, in our world, our world meeting, whether it's academic or physical or, or a, a pra practice, the physical is totally essential that that we make stuff. Um, I was talking to uh, Tom Fries this morning and his daughter just got in the Fashion Institute. Um, I mean, there's certain, some places that are just closing. They don't even have, you have the options we have, <laughs> right? It's only physical. And um, I I think it's actually be kind of interesting, actually, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to just... Um, <sighs> This is, strangely enough, the manifestation of globalization. This is the reality of the global world, and this is nothing new. This is going to be taking place now, or this is the new, the new normal, and it will repeat. And um, some will be solved scientifically with vaccine, and it'll, it'll be solved in, in, a, in, a, in a real way. And again, um, going back to Larissa's question, if, if our work is more and more connected to biological thinking, um, we think the way evolutionary biologists think, and they're solving it by understanding the molecular structure and the activity of the human body, right? And they can understand the nature of, of um, that at that level. And I think that our thinking has to be it's a little more connected to the way they think. But um, I, it's an interesting question, Hernan. I, nobody, nobody knows what's happening, but it's going to be um, definitely we're going to be changing the way we behave. Um, like a lot of you, um, what is this, the second week, two and a half weeks? Yeah. What, three? Huh? Uh, I don't know about you. I've been exhausted in front of this fucking screen for, for eight hours a day. And um, I have to touch people, man. I'm really out of it. Um, I can't grab your arm. I'm like done. And uh, it's a killer. <laughs> yes. I'm, a, I'm, yes the end. Just, I'm enjoying and, um, that part. You're, um, oh, my God. And, um, Blythe's been making bread, and I, I deliver bread to people and, and, and get a sub shot of like, handing them something that's physical. Um, Best uh, bread in town, by the way. <laughs> Best bread in town. But uh, anyway, it's gonna yeah, it's gonna be. Um, look, we're adapters. Uh, what, did, what did Darwin say? The, the the survivors are neither the most intelligent or the or the strongest. They're the adapters. And that's where we that's where we, that's where we are. And we're a creative group, and we will adapt, and we will find ways of kind of making this next world work. 
and it will for, for be sure long. it will not go back it's going to be more yeah. so right and it's going to travel faster and it's going to be more intense not less intense right and we'll figure it out for sure I, to say the least it's going to re, re, make all of us rethink the habitat in which we do now that we are spending three weeks and probably multiple weeks ahead of us inside our homes for sure it's going to keep it's going to change finally we maybe start to rethink in typology of, of the single family homes and many other things. So I think they will have also say very pragmatic, straightforward architectural problems that are gonna come out of this. Then it's gonna be super interesting. I mean, like even the, the, the we're gonna have to add the zoom space to the typology of a home because this is what we're gonna operate. So I think there is a lot of interesting, very fascinating things that gonna occur out of this. Also within the most disciplinar aspect of our field not only kind of the new possibilities, but also to revisit certain things that we took for granted. And then when we had to live in cycles of 24 hours, we are all rethinking about what it means to live inside and what, what is interior of a space. So I'm, I'm intrigued by that. I'm intrigued what that, that is doing to all of us. And, that, and I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna reshuffle a lot of things that we're gonna teach and discuss in the years to come. I mean, I think we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna rethink, the, the, in a different way, like 9-11 changed forever how we travel. And this is gonna change forever other things. So um, again, I, I, the optimism in me in trying to see what are the opportunities for us as, as uh, holistic thinkers, architects we are, and how we're gonna able to contribute that. That's why I think your, your talk to me was interesting because um, it, it talks about the evolution of your own met methodology and, and going from an in introspective way of the drawing and the drawing as your tool into communicate with much larger teams and to change the tools of communication and how we put together things. Um, this is going to be uh, an acceleration of that in other levels. So um, I, I think that is that to say the least is going to be fascinating. Uh, it's interesting because it reminds you of things that are maybe kind of obvious and that um, uh, Blythe and I have, have talked a lot about the, um, the importance of day-to-day -day rituals um, that our lives change quite a bit. Like I'm sure a lot of you, when you're, you're, you're locked into your, a singular kind of residence or even your situation is personally, um, and we've shifted our rituals and that uh, we, we have candles for dinner and set the table a certain way. And, and make it somewhat formal, and we have a different kind of breakfast, and we, we we've, it's 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 firmed up our own kind of relationship. I I I grind coffee, and I press it in a French press a certain way, and I have a kind of a very particular way of doing it that, that takes five minutes, and it's it it, it remind and you, we take a shower. Of course, I have an outside, and I am in the garden, which is fun, but it it reminds you of really basic kind of rituals, and we uh, we get together with our two sons. One is in the why one in New York and we have boulevardiers and, and, and tell stories and um, it, it's interesting that way and by the way I can I can uh, get to Syark now in 10 minutes on a freeway that's empty driving 100 miles an hour and and for all of you um, and my advice is you can drive as fast as you want no policeman will even allow you to open the window and I decided if that, I was driving here now when I came to deliver the bread I literally hit 105 <laughs> miles an hour on the freeway and I decided if I was stopped, I'm saying, I think I have, a, I think I've got the disease. I'm heading to the hospital. I know they wouldn't even they'd tell me to close the window. Um, and, the, and the air, <laughs> by the way, is beautiful. This is what it looked like in 1940s, guys. This could be like this for two months. You just had to get rid of the fucking cars. By the way, that might change. If, if people started working at home and they put half the cars on the freeway, we could both go someplace we needed to get to and the air would be clean. So that's going to be good news. Just get rid of half the fucking cars. And uh, that'll come out of this too. <laughs> anyway, hey, this, uh, has been, this, this has been fun. I think this is a great way to finish, Tom. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, for everybody who's there, next, uh, next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Again, quarantine talks from the kitchen. Uh, I, I'll see if we can get another uh, special guest. If not, I'll, I'll talk about something else. Um, this is actually quite, I, I hope it's fun for everybody. I think at, at least it, it helps all of us to remain connected in a more relaxed and informal way. And, and you get to see all of us talking from our homes. Um, and, and, and I think there is some, something unique about that. So there may be some silver linings in this process that we can all enjoy. So Tom, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, okay. A true pleasure. 
And thank Thanks, you, everybody, Tom. for showing up. Um, I'll see you guys next Wednesday at 7. Thank you.